Nissan Bulavinaka, Namaste, Noi Mori, and welcome to Season 6 of Back in Time 2019. There's so much to look forward to this season as we dig further into our chronicles of history. This week, we go back to the year 1996 and we visit a self-help development scheme in Nambaudiwa in Tailevu. We join the celebrations in Singatoka in establishing its official sister city scheme and later look into the successful bus building company of P.A. Lal Coachworks. But to begin, we now travel eight kilometers out of Nausori to the village of Nambaudiwa to witness some of the development works undertaken to assist the village. The self-help scheme, although designed to provide infrastructural and development assistance for rural communities, is applied only to those who are willing to make one-third of the financial commitment, ensuring self-reliance and communal ownership over the developments. The village setup in Fiji may generally be similar, but there are also many differences owing more to geography rather than anything else. Some enjoy the cool breeze of the ocean, Others, the shelter of the interior of a mainland, at a riverbank, or even near roads. But Nambodiwa is somewhat different. Being one of the villages on a delta, she is completely surrounded by mangroves. Nambodiwa is only 8 kilometers from Nausori, but is inaccessible by road. It takes about half an hour to travel down the Nasilai River from the Nakelo Landing. For the past few weeks, this tributary has been the route through which heavy building materials have been cut to the village for a long-term project yet to be completed. Since the day I was born, all I can remember is that there were 32 wooden houses in our village which were constructed by our parents. Only two of those old buildings still stand today which are about 104 years old. In the past decade, if you walk in this village during the rainy days, you'll find yourself covered up to the knees in mud. And usually you'll find a bucket of water in every household to clean your feet before entering a house. But now, you don't have to remove your shoes if you travel from soon. If Fijians are to survive, I believe in only two ways. Educate our children and be faithful in serving the Lord Almighty. Various difficulties continually faced by villages led to a proposal in 1982 for a long-term development project aimed at reconstructing the whole village. It took the villagers a full five years of fundraising before government came to their help in 1987 when they started the first stage of development. It wasn't easy. The ground level of the whole village had to be raised by three feet above the former swamp area and the village boundary was also extended. Raising the level also meant a more reliable drainage system had to be built. All houses in the village were also raised without destroying their former structure. Government has been monitoring the progress of this project all along. When government moved in to assist the Nambodiwa project in 1987, it was uh, the inspiration of the people, the aspiration of the people was already there. And it really welcomed government to assist in the project. In 1987, as uh, the committee member has mentioned, it started off with the extending the boundary and raising the village level. And that, as you can see, it has the boundary which extends is five times as large as it was the original size. And that was the first stage. The current stage that we are on, the second stage, is the drainage within the village. Having a playground was only a dream to the children of Nambodiwa, since the water reached their doorstep. But now, cassava can be grown successfully in the former swamp area, something thought impossible by village elders. 
Funding for the project will mainly through contribution of villagers with the help of government through its self-help project scheme. Villagers are now working on the project's second stage, which includes the installation of a proper drainage system in the village to ensure a free flow of water during high tides. It's now 13 years since the project started, which is in line with the village master plan prepared specifically for the project. At the moment, we, we, we are having about 108, 108 uh, lots you know, where to build houses. So you can see that uh, it has been increased from 37 to 108. And uh, the layout we have, that uh, we have uh, divided up the village into uh, four matangalis that we have. And we have to put them into their respective matangali. And included in that 108 lots is a community center, which includes a church, a cooperative shop, a community hall and uh, the meeting house for the Vanua, this uh, the Valley This year's work plan includes drainage construction, the relocation of houses to their permanent lots, the construction of footpaths, which is hoped to be completed by September. The completion of this Nambodhiwa development self-help project will see a fully developed 108 residential lots within the village boundary. The villagers are beginning to realize their dream. Welcome back. In this segment, we visit Singatoka and join the celebrations on the formal establishment of the sister city link between Singatoka and Japanese city, Sumoto. This initiative would see Singatoka the first urban area to undertake such a program in Fiji, if not the Pacific. In this segment, we find out the outcomes of such a partnership and why the town of Singatoka was chosen over others in Fiji. The sister city concept is new in the country, but it's not something totally new altogether. In fact, almost every town and city in Japan has its sister city somewhere in the world. It's uh, quite unique and uh, I've never known this kind of event has happened, um, at least in my experiences. So I hope uh, it can be continued and someday in the future I hope uh, it will uh, maybe set up about a sister city program or whatever. It had never been between Fiji and Japan. So um, this is, I think, the first stepping stone for this kind of purposes. But why Singatoka when there are other towns in Fiji? Well, Singatoka is as good a town as any, if not better, having a lot to offer. The sister city concept has been a long-standing invitation by Sumoto to Singatoka, only taken up recently. I sincerely hope that after this uh, delegation, go back to Sumoto, will um, uh, confirm the invitation and we hope to take it from there. There is no better way to establish a relationship than an afternoon of learning each other's cultures. Singatoka is a town one can't miss when traveling to the Western Division. Not only that, 
It's along one of Fiji's finest stretches of the coral coast, which has earned itself a place on international tourist brochures over the years. Singatoka was declared a town 37 years ago in 1959, a town that was meant to be a hitching post for villagers, farmers and travellers has over the years become one of the most popular tourist destinations in the country. And this has over the years been changed not only for the landowners but business people as well. Visit the Coral Coast and there's a distinct feeling of two different worlds. On the one hand, there are tourist resorts strewn along its beachfront, from as far as the border between Serua and Nandrunga all the way to Lomawai in Nandi. Leave the urban center, one enters another world altogether. Rolling hills with cane fields can be seen from miles on end on one side and the other side of Singatoka town lies the salad bowl of Fiji. Like tourism development in the area, the salad bowl had also made its mark in the international arena. Fruits and vegetables from here are exported overseas. And then there's the world-renowned Pacific green coconut manufacturing industries. And down the road, the Fijian or Shangri-La, the rolling sand dunes and also the Tabuni hill fort. All this make up Singatoka. So, rural and urban visitors all enjoy the facilities and amenities provided by Singatoka town. Singatoka happens to be the nerve center of a huge province, Nandrunga, Navosa, which has a population of about 50,000 people. Its day-to-day -day activities are administered by councillors elected to office by the people. Having to cater to the needs of a very diverse group of people, not only locally but overseas as well. It seems that Singatoka knows what it needs. Those responsible for the day-to-day -day running of this Coral Coast town have major plans they hope will boost the town's economic activities. First on the drawing board is the extension of the town's present market to cater for its vendors. This will mean moving the bus stand to the present municipal car park. There are also plans to upgrade the Lawanga Sports Complex. A $3.2 million grant from the Ministry of Youth, Employment Opportunities and Sports will improve Lawanga Park. The improvement works will see the construction of a main playing field with an eight-lane track, a training field, a stadium, four changing rooms, a police post, a radio control room, first aid and referees room. Residents in the area believe this is long overdue, especially since Nandronga has over the years been producing some of the country's best sportsmen and women. The town is financed by the assessment of yearly land tax based on the assessment of the unimproved capital value of land within the town boundaries. Its main source of income is town rates and business license. Well, I strongly feel that uh, it will benefit Singatoka by means of tourism. As you can see, the 36 delegations that have arrived into a country and spending the weekend at, in the Coral Coast, and uh, Singatoka is the heart of the Coral Coast, uh, they benefit from uh, means of the income from tourism, trade employment, and of course, uh, the system from Sumoto City will certainly help Singatoka town. Good evening. This is our final segment for our program this evening. Here we take a look into the bus building business in Fiji, specifically PA Lal, or otherwise known as Lal Coachworks. The family-owned business, synonymous to the industry, began as far back as 1968. And in this segment, we take a quick look at its successful journey. Fiji depends a lot on the road transport service. Apart from providing roads, jetties, and airstrips, government's major role in the sector has been to regulate the operation of the industry to make it more efficient. Statutory organizations like the Ports Authority and the Civil Aviation Authority of Fiji have been largely responsible for sea and air transport service. However, road transport, particularly public service vehicles, are controlled and managed by the private sector, an enterprise that's free of any capital input by the government. 
The late P. A. Lal was one of the bus building pioneers in the early 1940s. He operated on the Suva Tamabua route. His foresight was one of the major factors which has today made Lal Coachworks the most successful bus builder in the country. In 1968, he went into partnership with a company in New Zealand called Hawk Coachwork to construct steel framed buses. This was again his uh, idea of improving the transport system in Fiji, where previously all buses were made out of timber construction. He was taking the transport industry to a new level, which is comparable to, say, Australia and New Zealand standards of buses. Mr. Lal says his company is very careful when it comes to providing a quality product and has over the years injected a lot of money in modernizing its operations. Obviously, one has to define the need of, of buses and coaches in a particular market. Ours is a market which has a particular need, it has certain things that is unique to our market and also we have to work within certain price ranges. For example, we try and use all galvanized steel, use a lot of fiberglass in our construction. This is designed to increase the life of the buses, the durability, which means the longer the bus lasts, the amortization of that investment takes a longer period. Therefore, the operator gets a better return on his investment. Right? It also helps for, him, for the fares to be lower. The body designs are internationally comparable, with emphasis on use of materials that suit local conditions. The main structural component used in the manufacture of buses are the cruciforms, molded on this huge machine. Different dyes are used to make different structural components. A hoop jig is used to set the parameters and main assembly is done on the rotary jig. Several of these are formed and mounted on the chassis, according to specifications from bus operators. Chassis with lower horsepower are mostly preferred because of low operational costs, less fuel consumption and cheap spare parts. We, as a manufacturer of new units, cannot be uh, competing with second-hand vehicles being imported. But we are very competitive if we, our product and our price structure is to be compared against newly imported vehicles of similar specification. Mr. Lal cautioned operators to be more careful when importing second-hand buses. Anything more than 10 years old is against the law, and there's every likelihood it might not even be registered. Although the company has exported its coaches to New Zealand in the past, local operators are still its main market. On average, Lal Coachwork builds 46 buses annually and last year built 52. The only country the company still exports to is Tonga. Lal says the smaller island nations do not have regulated transport industry like Fiji and mostly rely on mini buses for their public transport. And the market that's left open to us is Australia and New Zealand. Australia has very strict laws and for a company our size to try and export to New Zealand, Australia, getting qualified for the vehicle to be registered in the countries under their design regulations would cost us at least half a million dollars to get a pre-qualification. And in itself there are a huge number of construction companies in Australia already which would make it very competitive. New Zealand we have not at recently because we have been quite busy with the local market but we have exported to New Zealand in 1987 when the exchange rates were very favorable and the Spartica helped us to get our product into New Zealand. 80 people work for the company which has an annual turnover exceeding four million dollars. And that is all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the program. You can get a copy from the Department of Information, Government Building Suva, for only $20. Stay safe and join us again same time next week as we dig more into the chronicles of history.